All right. Good morning. Welcome back. This is the Rehoboth Social Podcast, part of the Social Podcast Network, www.socialpodcastnetwork.com. Check it out. Local folks doing local podcasts. Good morning. Good morning. Morty McCarr. How are you, man? I'm good. Thank you. Awesome. Great to see you. Um, another one of my, I call you guys the Instagram hustlers. <laughs> I love Instagram because there's a lot of hustlers out there and I, you know, and I, Somehow I came across, I don't know if we somehow friended each other or something, but I started following you and putting out a lot of great stuff, attentive to your Instagram feed, which I think is always important, you know. Um, yeah, so good morning, Marty Bacars, and you have the Lakeside Pottery. Yes. How are you, man? I'm doing great. Good morning. I did find you on uh, Instagram. I saw that you do running yep. hiking in the trail which we live right next door to it so i ran this morning that's what i got you got associated with my uh proximity to you physically where you are uh what a gift that trail is right it is we live right behind it so without being spe specific i mean do you live in midway or do you live in breakwater where do you live right behind it do you live in lewis side we live in hawk side uh, okay our house is right against the marsh all the way to the end okay yep so yeah i ran this we ran this we run monday wednesday and friday so we ran this morning did five miles it was amazing that's pretty cool i Very, wish i can do that you can we, hey, listen. You want to come do something? I'll walk with you. Uh, no, I do bicycle riding there. Okay, we, we do the loops, the, the seventeen miles once in a while. The tour to for, the tour to Rehoboth. Yes, yes. Yeah, and everybody thinks they're in a peloton riding like maniacs. On are you one of those guys, Morty? No, you know we go a bunch of friends, sixteen miles. Sometimes we go to have ice cream right right at the farm there, uh, the other side of the trail. The oh, so down like at the the um, by down. Uh, Dairy Farm Road. Yes, yes. Okay, so, yeah, so I'm on, I'm at Breakwater Trail. We do both. We oh. do that and sometimes the other one, yeah. Well, it is a gift. I don't know whoever's idea that was, but thank you. Thank you for the trail. We love it. So let's talk about what you do because, um, like you said, we kind of got introduced through Instagram. I, I reached out and you said, I don't think I have anything to talk about. And I said, I'm sure you do. We always have something to talk about. And, um, but the funny thing is we almost had like a podcast over the phone. We did. I'm like, yeah, I'm like, Morty, <laughs> let's save this for the podcast because I won't have anything to talk to you about. But it says, you know, and I asked you, what do you do? And you said you're a ceramic artist and an art restorer. And if anybody wants to check out his site, it's www.lakesidepottery.com, right? And it's got some examples of some of the stuff you do. And looking at it, I can't believe you fixed that. And what I'm looking at is a beautiful... Ancient, I don't know how old that piece of pottery is, but it's busted. It, no, this one is a 300 years old uh, ice cream server. Um, oh, wow. It's a, a collectible item. The and it's broken. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's broken in the picture, but you fixed it. Yes. So do you want to tell you, why don't we start there? How do you, how'd you get into that? How do you get into fixing stuff that doesn't look like it could possibly could be put back together well you know it, it does require a lot of disciplines you know that the whole materials processes uh the painting uh, cementing you know so there are many pieces to it it started with me being an engineer for many years and then retiring from that and opening an art school ceramic art school three di three-dimensional art and we spun off restoration it's a long story for a different day it was totally by accident and I just fell in love with the restoration, um, mostly because the technology that is available today to restore items is the same as what it was 30, 40 years ago. And I felt the materials used um, need to change. So I went on a journey just to research that and I found out that there is a whole market there. There are a lot of people in museums that have stashed stuff that nobody can repair in the basement someplace. And I took it as a challenge, hired some good people and it was an extension of our ceramic school. And yeah. before you know, word of mouth just took off and uh, it became a whole different business. Now, do you find this like, you know, like especially like what we're kind of going through right now, tons of people are moving. Everyone's on the move right now, packing up. A lot of people packing up kind of hasty, right? We got to go, you know, like, oh, someone's buying our house. They want it in 30 days. We got to get out. So everyone's packing. Do you find, I mean, Maybe like even in the the housing market, big changes around the communities where people are coming and going. Do you find you find more people having broken stuff or is it just a steady business? 
It is a steady with the exception of some phenomena that occur. We, we do work nationally. I mean, you know, local, very few in between. We get stuff all the way from Alaska, Hawaii, California, uh, Europe, uh, Far East. Uh, so, so packages arrive every day. And, and the reasons are different. It's pretty steady. You know, I do about eight estimates a day and we get two projects out of there. So that's, that's a ratio. Our website receives four or 5,000 visits a day because of all the tutorials and the lessons we have uh, and that yield that two projects a day. But we get um, bumps, big bumps, like if there's an earthquake in California. Yeah, well, that's kind of the example I was we thinking about. That. I, I yes. used everybody moving, but you have these moments where, yeah, a, a, an earthquake, exactly. Yeah. Shake the place apart. Right. Uh, other bumps we get, we get now quite a bit. We do something called Kintsugi. Kintsugi is repairing pottery with gold. It's based on a metaphor that broken is better than new, and people take it as if they suffered with their, the pandemic, uh, depression, or post-traumatic stress disorder. Psychotherapists, religious places buy it from us, and basically it's a broken pot that uh, repaired with gold, and that's part of our restoration effort. We find out that from having 20% of our business doing that, now it's 50% of the business. So we hear stories all day long of people that want to use that Kintsugi gold repaired item as a metaphor. Can we? Can you maybe explain that a little bit? Because I'm right now wondering what, what the heck you're talking about. Yeah, so uh, you have a pot that broke. Yep. Uh, and there are two options for you. Uh, one of them, is, well actually three, one of them to throw it away. Ooh. The other one is to restore it seamlessly, just like you've seen in the picture on the web there. And the other option is to repair it and instead of make it seamless, um, punctuate the repair line. Show it in a dramatic way by uh, running gold. Repair it and trace it with gold. So everything is broken now, is shown extremely visible. Gold is shiny, it's uh, so, and that in a lot of cultures, it um, refers to show your scars, be proud of who you are, all your suffering made, made you a better person, and that object gonna project that metaphor for you to remember that the fact that you suffered actually made you a better person, or, uh, or in a religious sense, God can make you better because you suffered. So, so, so different groups, different cultures use that metaphor for different purposes. Well, but during this pandemic, and it's funny because I was, I wanted to ask you about that. So it's funny, it's cool that you brought it up. You know, we were watching, and I, I'll find the guy's name, but he does art restoration. And so the people send him, you know, art from like old churches, I don't know, just old art, especially, you know, that's covered in soot or have been damaged. And, you know, he, his point is, he's, he, I'm a restorator, I restore. I'm not trying to trick you to think that this was never damaged. So there's interesting ways that they show, like if a face has been, you know, maybe that whole part of the face is even gone. I think one of the examples that we have watched, he was restoring a, a painting of a cherub and half the face was gone. So he had to literally, he filled it and then repaint it, but he painted it in a way with like lines so that it was there, but it was clear that it had been restored. He didn't want to, his job is to not pretend like there was never damage it's been restored it's clear that this is old this is my work it's clearly out there but it's done in a way that it it doesn't like you don't get stuck on that spot right like if you had done nothing but it's it, but it's done enough where you can move through the painting or through the art and you don't get hung up on it but it's still saying listen this has been restored so that's that's interesting so what you're saying is all the restoration that you do is shown in gold this, well, there are three offerings. One of them is the Kintsugi, which it's restored with gold. The other one is seamless, which used to be most of what we do. And there is a third one that refers to what you just said. We call it um, ancient pottery repair. Uh, and that is for uh, items with historical value, usually museums that use us, is that they don't want to touch any surface that exists. When you do seamless repair, you sort of steal a little bit away from the existing surface to integrate the painting into the existing one. Right. So uh, so ancient repair is you leave everything that you've restored apparent, it's a little bit with off color to show that this is not the original part, this was added on. 
um, and we do that as well. Not too many of them, but we do that as well. Well, and I was amazed that you know, during watching this guy that did these restorations, that you know, you, you know, you may a painting may go to um, a museum or something, and they'll have it there on loan, and sometimes they'll restore, re-restore it, like they'll, because the, one of the things that this guy was big and talking about is like everything I'm doing can be reversed you know maybe back in the day you used a glue or something that you couldn't get off but everything that he did and I can't see you taking apart like something that's broken again but um, the restorations that he did you know if this piece goes to a different museum and they don't like what I've done and they have a person that does restorations they can redo it um, so it's you know what I'm talking about? It's, it, it's, it, it's a whole different topic. I, I've participated in a lot of forums and, uh, and spoke about it. So, so the reason why museums mostly do reversible refer, uh, repairs is because they didn't think that any repair would last indefinitely, and at one time it's going to fail, so you have to redo it again and to re-restore the integrity of the object. Uh, we do not do reversible repair. And the reason why is that the items that made with many museums or many restorers from the old school, they still use the same material they used in the 60s. Uh, so they're afraid to frontier their materials into something that's going to last indefinitely. So this sort of got stuck in a loop of the repair is not that great, to my opinion. It's sufficient. But because it's not that great, it's going to fail eventually, so they have to redo it. So, so, so we went with permanent restoration method we use advanced technology and materials that are frontier like like we use some aerospace material for example okay so etc cetera, etc cetera. so so everything we do permanent now they said how do you know that it's going to last 100 years um and i said i don't because i'm not going to live that long <laughs> but uh there are all sort of tests that you can project the longevity of materials like uh um UV light. You put it in a drawer with extreme UV light that if you put it there for six months, it would be the equivalent of 100 years. And you can prove this mathematically. But they don't really relate to that. They want to stay safe. And that's what we do. That's why, you know, that's why we guarantee everything we do for life. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and you mentioned a technology. The fact is, is that they're still using like fish glue, um, animal glues, you know, these old style, you know, and I'm talking about the art. I don't know. They probably didn't have super glue back in the day, you know. Super glue is really bad. No, no. Super glue is don't, bad. Don't, everybody that listens, don't use super glue. Uh, it, it turns yellow. It, it falls apart after a few years. You know what I use super glue for? Gluing my feet back together. <laughs> when my feet split from running, I glue them back oh, together. Oh, yeah, yeah. When, when you get cracked by the nail. Yeah, that's what, you, that's what I, I have super glue for one thing, gluing my feet back together. Um, well, and there's probably, you know, where you know you look at so like on the on your website, there's a piece of there that's shattered. Obviously, you're not putting that back together for someone to possibly take apart and put back together. But let's say like a surface or a painting, and I don't want to get stuck on just different ways of restoring, like I on the show that I had watched. But I just thought it was inter interesting in, in that you started to kind of mention it that you show that well, listen, this has been restored, and you know through the gold or whatever you the name of it. Kintsugi. Kintsugi. I should write that down. But <clears throat> right, but again, when, when we do the seamless repair, you cannot tell that it's been restored. So how do you do that? How do you do, or do you want to share your secrets? No, we, we have like well, know, 40 tutorials on the web that, that attracts all these visitors. No, we share everything. So yeah. on, your, the, on your website? Yeah. Do yeah. you have a YouTube channel? We do. Okay, what is the same thing? Lakeside Pottery. So if people want to see how you, some of the work you do, they can find you on YouTube. It's all in there. Yes, we share. In fact, I get calls from restorers saying, I won't use the exact word they've used, but what the XX you're doing? You know, you're telling everybody how we do it. And, in, and, and what I try to relate to them, that it actually brings more business because when they see how it's done, they realize they couldn't do it themselves. Right. And then they click and we get an estimate request. Nice. Yeah. So do you do, um, I'm also looking, it looks, do you guys make pottery or what yeah. else goes on over at this? So, so we have, uh, we built this home with, uh, with the intention to do art. Patty is an amazing painter. She works in the restoration. She's also a sculptor. So we have three studios at home. We have a painting studio. And this is your wife. My wife, Patty. Patty, Stokes. right. Yeah. Yeah. She's your partner. So, um, so we have painting studio, we have the restoration studio, and pottery and sculpting studio. Three entities that, uh, 
it's a small subset of our facility in Stanford, Connecticut, but it's just for us. You know, we had staff and we had a whole operation. Now it just sort of simplifies, so we pick and choose. Sometimes we get sick of restoration, so we focus on pottery and we move around based on. Well, do you think? Have you seen a lot of? Have you seen like? a change in the popularity or maybe people be becoming a little more interested in going through kind of what we've been going through in the past year. Like people are, we used to have a cool place you could go down and just find pottery and paint it, you know, and fire it and you kind of make a fun cup. Um, but I don't think that's around anymore. So have you seen people kind of get fun, show more interest, just finding, trying to find things to do and maybe with family? I don't even, I don't know what kind of operation you have. You have to tell no, me. No, you know, we're not open to the public. Uh, so okay. well, so we, we do everything. Uh, some, people drop off stuff sometimes and pick up, but we on purpose, we didn't want to be open to the public. Again, remember, most of our customers are everywhere, not just in the right. local area. Yeah. So you receive a lot of stuff through the mail? Every day, yeah. Have you ever received something that got broken in the mail? Yeah. Jeez. And did you have to fix it? Well, we, we have to charge more. They're like, uh, oh, by the way, it got broken, and now we're going to have to fix that too. <laughs> no, in fact, I have, I, have, I have a collection of things where, you know, we give them instructions how to pack it, and sometimes people don't pay attention, and, uh, and sometimes it's a legitimate damage. UPS sort of smashed it. Uh, so, so they get money from the insurance, and they said, okay, keep it. So I have, I have a collection of things that, that are really valuable that broke more and they left it with us. One day I'll restore them. Patty wants them like a Han Dynasty horse and rider, a thousand years old, you know, broken more than its value, but I'll get to it sooner or later. Do you, when somebody wants to, and I'm not familiar with this world, really, the, 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 per, the pottery world, but like if I was going to use like an example of like a guitar, you know, um, there's a guitar, the Les Paul, you're familiar with Gibson Les Paul. So there's a year, you know, Gibson has a, a tendency to break at the headstock. And there's ways of repairing it. And there's ways of repairing it to a point where I wouldn't know that you repaired it. Is that what you try to do? Do you want people to not be able to see? Or do you put it out there that this has been repaired? Like like that vase up there. I mean, I can only see it on the on with from where I'm sitting. I have I can't look at it up close. Would I be able to know that that's been put back together? No. So do you divulge? Do you tell that or divulge that information? Or do you? I guess if it's someone's personal thing, they're not selling it. No, I mean you can That's that's all idea for most of what we've done until recently, because the Kintsugi, as I mentioned, taking over now. But but the seamless repair, you just can't see it. Uh, if if you go to um, so our Google reviews or Better Business Bureau, whatever people re reviews, you know, it's all five stars. It, it blows people away, uh, especially those who are not professional. The professional just expect it to be seamless and they don't uh, stroke you too much because that's that's what they're paying for. But somebody had some, something that was their grandmother and that's the only thing that remains from grandma, they're devastated. And, and, and they want it back the way it was, or, or religious statues that they pray to for generations, whether it's a person or a church, and, and, and they get it back in a hole. And they can, sometimes it looks better because if it comes, we also clean it, we, we touch up here and there, and, and it's extremely satisfactory to be in that situation. The only difference that I've seen during the pandemic, uh, more people call after the submit the estimate request, they just want to talk about it. And I told Patty, you know, like I spent half a day talking to people, listening to the story, and I start pushing it a little bit away, let the voicemail pick up. And, and she said, um, this is really important now, talk to them. So we do, I got a couch in the studio and I put my feet up and I, listen, I just got a new phone with a good speaker phone so I can work while I'm listening. And, and the stories that you hear are amazing. Uh, uh, people becoming more in touch with the ancestors and, and things that are more meaningful um, during the pandemic. I, I, I see it every day. I do too. I feel like it's 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 basically said, hey, pump the brakes. Let's get back to, I don't know what life was like. I don't know what we would call that, but let's revert back a bit and start. And, you know, in my business, in the hair business, I mean, people just, they just want to talk. I did a lady's hair the other day. She had not been out for a year. Right. I can't imagine. I'm like, wow, that's, you know, so, you know, this is a time where people, you know, you have to take an extra minute 
a couple minutes or whatever and, and so, listen. Sometimes longer. Like uh, we have a lot of examples, you know, people like, you know, if somebody lives in West Pennsylvania, they ship it. It costs them $20 to ship something. And they said, oh, can we drop it off? I said, well, it's like seven hours drive. I said, please, we need to get out of the house. Nice. So, so they drive all the way here. I show them the bathroom, wear a mask, put, put the thing in their hand. And, of course, you know, we show them around the studio just to make the trip worthwhile. And the drive back. So can I guess how you fixed it? I mean, I'm not going to guess how you fixed that. I, I know you want us to go to the YouTube, but I, I'm still, I need to know. I mean, I'm imagining um, some sort of adhesive, putting it back together. Do you bake it? Do you refire it? How no, do you make no, this the, seamless? The, there are about a dozen steps. Uh, the most complicated step is to the painting. Like, for example, you see the Picasso platter there. Um, Scroll down a bit there, Cole. This is like the most complicated because you have... The Picasso platter is the one that's... The, the, the black back. and blue there. Oh, yeah, okay. So, so that's a real Picasso. That's a real Picasso. Oh, my God, and someone broke it. Yeah. And, oh, my God. Uh, they actually, this guy wanted to liquid it because they're running out of money, so so he wanted to restore it. But the uh, but the painting, the, the hand stroke is continuous, and then it's broken, it's missing some segments, and then you have this patch. How do you connect from the right side of the painting to the left side of the painting through a gap and make it look continuous. People think that... I'm, I want to hear. How uh, do we do that? Uh, it's not what you think. Uh, first of all, um, you have to start building the colors. You start with the color of the clay and you build the color of the base glaze and then you build the colors in the same order the artist used it because with glazing, you can see one color through the other. So, so if I just did blue in this case, it would look sort of like, okay, so somebody just threw some blue in here. Uh, because some most of the paints are a little bit tr uh, translucent, you've got to show all this layer to show the depth. And then the last thing you do, you practice the stroke. I mean, you have to know uh, how the artist threw that brush in. So you you try on on a tile and until you get the stroke just right. And you cannot do this slowly. You have to do it fast. Otherwise, it's going to look like you've done it slowly. So 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 you sort of get to the head of the artist. And, and different artists of different strokes, and then through the years, you you become accustomed. You know what needs to be done. And then, when you end the stroke, you see that ending where where you depart. Then you use a lot of miniature airbrushes to integrate, or what we call feather in or feather out, um, that end and beginning. So, so there are many in this. Five, there are probably fifteen to twenty layers of, of paints. So how? I, so you. I mean, that makes it even tougher, right? Because even if you're painting with paint, you can see the color. At least you get an idea. But with when you're firing, I mean, do you literally fire between each layer or do you just build no. up the layers and fire it all together? We don't fire. We it, It's all secondary materials. Okay, so there's no you're not having to refire it. The only time we refire, if you have an item, like it's a sculpture with missing hand, we sculpt the hand uh, with clay and then we have to fire it in a kiln. There are a lot of things that come with missing pieces, especially... Um, Pre-Columbian and Han Dynasty, Tang, you know all those ancient stuff, Israelites or things from Afghanistan, or whatever they are. Uh, the collectors want us want to, they, the reason why they use us and not others primarily for those very antique items is I don't know anybody that sculpt the missing pieces from true pottery. They want right. the, the, the item to be as uh, authentic as possible. So we use different clays. We use the terracotta for the Han Dynasty. We use, you know, whatever that we need to use. And uh, they have something called a loop test where, where they put ultrasound uh, in, in a loop around the whole sculpture. And if there is material change, the sound will change. It's like a whistle and all of a sudden different sound. So they know that this is polymer material as opposed to clay. If they do loop testing with our sculpted item for those hired items, it would sound continuous, the same mm. materials. Okay. So for some people it's important, some people don't care. Well, and that was a kind of a, a, a thought. I think my parents have, I mean, it's, it's flat, it's, um, you know, place settings and plates and all that. But if you were to like, uh, I mean, that's China, right? That would be like, it's not really pottery. Like if a big chip came out of one of these big serving dishes, my dad, I mean, we've got some, some old stuff, and I think one of them has a big chip. I mean, would that even be something you could do something to to fix, or would you, or would you ever? I mean, have you ever said, "Listen, 
that chip shows this the age. I mean, do you fix everything to be perfect, or do you? Yeah, we do, but but we don't want to do chips. You know, right. we, we sort of want to do more of art. So the way we got around, and I'm sorry, audience, we our starting price is 140 dollars. So who's gonna pay 140 dollars for a chip? It takes 10 minutes to do. So I don't know. So that's how we weed it out. Depends how bad you want the chip fixed. Uh, just, yeah, yeah. Well, I guess the point <laughs> of the question was: Do you say, hey? Don't bother with the chip. I mean, it's it shows the age. It's not perfect. Or do you say, yeah, if that's what you really want, we'll fix the chip. I don't tell them how to think. You know, different people, different strokes. You know, it's whatever they want. Sure, yeah. that makes sense. I would, I would, I would guess that. I would be. So. Um, so, what's the biggest thing you've had to fix? It was, uh, and I forgot his name. It's somebody known uh, in the sport industry. Damn it! I wish I would have remembered. So he went to Africa. He's an African American. He went to Africa and he got connected spiritually to to his uh, ancestors, uh, and he brought in a bunch of statues, um, Shona stone statues. Some of them are like 150 pounds. It was created and it came in um, I don't know 40 pieces. It was totally broken. Oh my gosh! And uh, so he sent his driver to bring it to our studio this was in Stanford, connecticut before we moved in a few years ago and um patty said can you do that i said i have no idea but the guy really begged me and i said i'll give it a shot i won't even give him price until i see what i have to do because uh, it was so broken and when you paint stone with all these broken pieces some of them chattered you have to sculpt new ones you can't put 100 pieces in a square inch into something valuable so you meet all this part you sculpt it and now you have all this surface which you have to paint something that looked like very uh, detailed stone. Um, so we did all the mechanical part. I'm trying to paint and it doesn't look like stone. It looks terrible. And then we have developed a whole new process. The reason why you couldn't paint it is because stone is porous. And the way you get the color of the stone is by putting bee wax. And it brings just like a, a rock in a river. When you get it wet, it has a different color. Mm -hmm. If you painted the, the color of what water does to the rock, it wouldn't look the same. So, so we start. We develop a process using uh, porous materials that behave like a rock. So instead of painting, we stain it uh, to make sure that there is continuity. So we stain all the detail of the rock, and that's what Patty is amazing. She can paint a rock that you might trip on, and it would be a piece of paper, you know. So nice. So that's that's what Patty does quite a bit. A very very detailed work. So, so anyhow, so, so we finished that project, and, and the guy says, listen, you know, I don't write things to too many people. I get requests every day. Uh, again, I forgot his name, um, and uh, he said, you altered my life, kind of a thing. So, you know, oh. it, it felt pretty nice how, to hear how that. How big was it? Um, later on, you can see it on the web. Oh, okay. Uh, go, go on the sculpture repair. Uh, but anyhow. BigSidePottery.com. So um, amazing stuff on there. Yeah, if, if you go down, further down, further down. Uh, I don't know if you're going to see it. It's going to be on the right side. Um, black. We're scrolling down. No, no, it's up. Go up. I'm sorry, no. taking your it's time, right. people. It's your time. Go, keep going up. Oh, this, this is, by the way, the ones you see right there, we, we did it for the Football Hall of Fame. We did a bunch of projects. This is Dick and Jones. I don't know if you know him. Oh, did their, did, did their bust statues get broken? Oh, yeah. Uh, go, go all the way to the top. You're going to see that. Uh, repair process. You see the stone all the way in the upper right corner, all the way to the corner? There's a link there to this repair oh, yeah. process. Oh, that's, wow. That's pretty big. I mean, you can see me holding this 200 pounds. I had to put... Oh, wow. So, wow. How did it break? Uh, in a crate in shipping. Oh, no. That looks awesome. Yeah, if anybody's, ch I mean, check this out. You might see out. the name of the person. I don't know if I put the, the letter that he wrote on, on the way on the bottom. I don't know if you would know the name. I'm not into sport too much, so I don't know all these people. People say, oh, you did Dick and Jones. I say, who is that? And everybody laughed at me that I don't know who that is. Carlos Fleming. Carlos Fleming. I don't know who that is either. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, listen, so how do you, I mean, so you're obviously up in Connecticut for a while. How do you end up in Rehoboth? How do you, I mean. Uh, through, through restoration. We had, we had a customer 
Uh, I mean, I'm gonna, he's, he's an amazing guy. His name is Mitch Crane. He's a judge. I didn't know any of this. I just knew his name, that he has a lamp that he wanted to restore. It was ridiculously expensive. I called him to try to talk about some of the details and why does he want to restore it. So he told me how important that is to his family. It's his father's that influenced uh, his future in, in the legal and in, in, in being a judge. So, and I said, well, where, where are you? He said, in Lewis, Delaware. I said, where is Lewis, Delaware? He said, well, it's here and there. I said, well, you know, I know Delaware is a place you drive through when you go to Virginia. So, so that's as much as I've known about Delaware. Right. So um, we'd like to keep it that way for a while. But so, so he said, you should come visit. I said, well, we actually were thinking about moving further south, but we don't know anything about it. He said, why don't you come visit? So it was a little bit awkward to get some stranger ask you to stay with him overnight. <laughs> I've never done that. He never did that. So Patty and I said, you know what? What the heck? Let's just do that. So we went. We stayed with him overnight, and that's it. We 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 drank the Kool Aid. Uh, what attracted us to Lewis is the. Um, the kindness, the acknowledgement of human being, which you don't see much in Stanford, Connecticut. You know, like like we we, we sat on Second Street or Second Avenue there, um, and um, in ten minutes, more people engaged in conversation and and how do you you know nodded their head and all, and it just felt home. And we said, this is it. That's where we're coming. So so very quickly, we bought the lot, sold the business, sold sold the building, the house, and moved here. How many years ago was that? Five years ago. Nice. Yeah, it is a. Um, it is. It has that that magical kind of moment where you visit this place. We, we were. My son works down in Rehoboth, and I was driving down, and I was talking to him about when I came and visited when I was fifteen, so thirty-seven something years ago, and just the you know you basically you drive through corn you know you're really going through nothing and then all of a sudden you end up in this cool little beach community and you're like wow yeah and uh yeah it'll 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 do a number on you what are some of the favorite things that you enjoy about this town i mean besides this year right this year has been such a bizarre year but prior to this and maybe hopefully moving forward we find some sort of i don't want to say normalcy but some sort of new routine what do you uh what do you miss and what do you love some of the most characteristics about this town that you love? Do you well, like going to the beach? Or you yeah, well, well, it started with, uh, you know, running a business in Sanford, Connecticut. It's the bedroom community of New York City. And I'm sorry of those of you in Connecticut listening to me <laughs> is uh, we began to get sense of entitlement. I don't know. I got older and crabby or I, and I start seeing it more or maybe. In yourself. No, not myself, in, in, in the people that came to our facility. Oh, okay, because I thought you said you started feeling more like I, entitled. I start feeling the entitlement affecting me. Okay, yes. And I don't know if it was it, me it changing yeah, I get or that. the people change, but it wasn't enjoyable anymore. You know, financially we did well, the business brought the revenue it needed, staff were happy, but there was something missing. So coming to Lewis, answering your question, is the opposite of entitlement. Right. Uh, that, that really attracted us. And then, we, you know, we are natural freaks. You know, I, I was in the board of a wildlife orphanage of Connecticut and now uh, and hiking and boarding and water sports and the whole thing. Uh, and it's not very accessible where we lived, you know, like, like the journey to get to some place, you know, you have to go, you have to find a parking spot, you have to, you know, the whole thing here, you just get out of your house and you take the bike and you're in nature. Yes. Uh, so accessibility to all this um, um, organic, um, love that we have to to nature is available to us, including looking from our patio, yeah, right into the marsh. Yeah. Well, and I think we're kind of in a cool spot because we've obviously got the ocean. Can't go that way, and we got a lot of marsh. Can't build there. I mean, at least I don't think. I mean, give it ten years, somebody will probably try to figure out how to do it. But you know, so we're kind of in an area where you know we still have we, have, and it's getting. It's changing. I won't say it's getting worse. It's changing. Uh, a lot of those people from Connecticut and New Jersey <laughs> and New York are moving here now. So the entitlement wave is on its way, but which is fine. Um, but luckily, we have these spots around that you know that still keep it so it can't be too overbuilt for now. We'll see what happens. But um, yeah, I, I heard this a lot. Uh, you know, yes, the traffic on the summer is heavy, but People that are here for a long time, they see the difference. For us, I compare it to I-95 and the Merritt Parkway, which B-52 
being in traffic here. It's a it's a breeze. It's nothing. People yeah. don't yeah. It's people nothing. don't yeah. People just like to have that complaint, but it's nothing it's compared nothing. to yeah. like DC no, or ninety five. I mean, I moved here from San Diego. Oh, you have Get on where the 805 and 5 yeah, come yes. together yeah. and talk about traffic. I mean, traffic yeah. is so bad in California. They educate you through radio. And I feel like we should kind of do that here. Um, you know, don't hit your brakes. Coast. Stay to the right. I mean, all the basic simple things to make traffic. Um, not that you want to keep it going, but learning what stops it, you know, by pumping brakes and stuff. So there's some – we could learn a little bit here. But our traffic – really, it's real – if we're going to be honest, it's basically between Wawa and McDonald's. That's basically the traffic yeah. problem. Right. It's like a mile. Right. Um, you uh, you said that you had a lot of staff in, in Connecticut. Did you bring a lot of them here? Or is it now a lot more smaller, just you and your no, wife? No, no. We we came with a mission statement and, okay. and, and two things that we promised. Patty and I are big in vows. Uh, so we said, okay, so we're aging. Mm-hmm. First of all, my elbows start hurting me with all this pottery stuff. People think it's art, and I'm saying, you know, yeah, it is art, but it's like You're pouring concrete, building, yeah. concrete all day long. So, so that is uh, Potter's elbow. Potter's elbow, <laughs> yes. Uh, but so we say, well, number one, simplify, make life simple. Uh, so having staff doesn't do that for you. Mm-hmm. And, and the other one is. Uh, you know, we we were giving a lot. You know, when when you have a teaching facility and you have artists using facility, so it's giving, 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 mm-hmm. and it's nice. But you get to a point that we didn't get to do what we wanted to do. So the other thing is, other than be, uh, simplify, is I don't want to do what I don't want to do. Right. I guess it sounds selfish. So. Well, I mean, like you said, you know, as you get older, it's like you know, you yeah. want to focus more on what you want to do. Right. Yeah. No, that's well, and I think the um, you know, as we get older simplifying just seems like it just comes up more right it's like it just i mean i i'm a little bit younger than you but i'm still you know i'm 52 and all i feel like doing is simplifying simplifying let's you know we want to try to get a new house none of this is coming with us you know it's like simplify and uh i don't know if it's age the time i think um covid this pandemic is I, i for me and i always i Carlos always says, you you speak with a broad brush. For me, it's really made me look at just how much junk I've gathered and how it's not necessary. And just, I don't know, it's made me take a hard look at myself. So I well, I'm actually glad you've done that. You know, uh, being an artist, there's a lot of solitude in it. And we sort of liked it. In a way, it gives us a chance to do more of what the we pandemic. Want to do. I mean, the quarantine. Yes. Yeah, I think a lot of people do. I, in a way, in a odd way, I don't want to. I, I do too. I love the little bit of the drama. You know, having to kind of be away. Right. I get it. I think I agree. It's a. Uh, I don't know how we're going to come out of it. Yeah, with me. Well, you know, I mean, you need both. I mean, eventually, it's going to. I mean, it start getting old. Um, so. Uh, I remember when it first happened, I was like, aha, nobody gets to come to the beach. You know, it was like, I was, I was like inside laughing, like, haha. Like, I don't know what that was about, but it was just this, I guess this real feeling is I wish I was the only one that lived here at Rehoboth, <laughs> nobody else. But we know that's not going to happen. Um, well, that's, that's, yeah, that's a great story how you ended up here. Do you, so have you had friends that move here? Have you just been able to stay and just kind of enjoy it? Have you has it been a lifestyle change for you? Because I know my in laws are up in Connecticut and it is they're tense, they're stressed. You know, it's very busy up there, in Connecticut. I think Connecticut. I think small town. It's really not. There's a lot of people in Connecticut. So has it been like? Have you toned it down a bit? Just been a little more? Because you mentioned you were becoming. You thought maybe possibly a little crabby. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It changed quite a bit. And um, in fact, one of our friends, actually a lot of our friends now wants to visit and uh, a few of them drank the Kool-Aid just like I have. One of them is building a house in Schofield now. The other one is exploring uh, the boarding entities. Is a cell, cell boarding guy. And they came last week. Sail boating. Sail boating. Okay. The, yeah. So it's importing like for a horse, horse boarding. Yeah. So, uh, but... I like that. You know, in fact, at the beginning it was annoying, but I learned that I enjoy what what happened to me. Like, for example, when we moved in, Patty said, uh, oh, I forgot the milk. Can you go get the milk? 
I said, okay, I'll see you in 20 minutes. He said, no, I'll see you in an hour because you always talk to people now. So, so, so um, I became more interested in people because, you know, you get accustomed to, like if somebody talks to you on the street, you think, what's wrong with them? And, and I was trained to feel the same way. And I opened up, like I wouldn't have that conversation with you. I'd be sort of quiet just listening to you. But so, uh, so that changed quite a bit since coming here. Well, and I think that, you know, people, it's weird. They're like, oh, I've read this book. You know, they're very well read. So according to them, the more well read they are, the more interesting they are. And I'm like, ugh. You know, I like conversation. I like learning about people. I think I'll become a little more interesting today having had a conversation with you about this. All of a sudden, I'm becoming more interesting. I think when we have more conversations with people, it's interesting. You know, people are, you know, unfortunately, you can't put it all, all the conversations we've had with other people up on a shelf to on display for all my friends. You know, it's something that I do, unlike a book. But I've, I, I love the conversations with people. I love... I love being positive. You know, I love trying to help. I think um, I was trying to do this prior to the pandemic. I think it's, I think it's the pandemic's exposed that at certain times we need to help others. And if it's just through conversation, you know, like when I asked you, let's, you want to come on the podcast? You're like, I got nothing to say. I don't know what I would talk about. <laughs> I guess it's working out. That's 40 good. minutes in. Yeah, 40 minutes <laughs> in. And we, it's a conversation. And, and um, I don't think, people give themselves enough credit to their interest. I mean, believe me, you have a lot of stuff going on that's interesting. That is, I mean, that's that's great. Um, so do you think the, um, so how do we go forward? I mean, I, you know, you're on Instagram. So obviously, you're trying to build business, right? Um, or you're a show off, one of the two. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> it, it's not. I'm, I'm on Instagram, believe it or not, because... So, so when we were at the art school, I was big on to documenting the lessons. You know, you get, I mean, we, we, we've trained over 15,000 people. Sure. In uh, Stanford, Connecticut. We had all the way from beginner to advanced, sculpting, hand building, pottery, da da da, corporate team building. We had the, the, the whole thing. And what happened is there are a lot of steps to learn it. And people come to a class, they come for two and a half hours, once or twice a week. They have some open studio and they forget. So I said, okay, I'm going to use the web and I start creating tutorials them to go home and, and refresh themselves. And before I know, the rest of the world is looking at us. And I said, wow, that, that's pretty cool. And, and I'm sort of hooked into teaching. I'm still, sure. the teacher in me is still there. So if I do something new, I put the camera in and document, I edit it and I throw it on the web for other people to learn. And so the Instagram, if you look at the Instagram, a lot of what you see there are lessons. Okay. Well, that's, I mean, well, my next question is, do you, and it doesn't sound like it, it sounds like you've been kind of into it for a while, does it become stressful dealing with social media? I know for me in this business, in the podcasting business, in the salon business, um, I don't even actually have a, a, an Instagram for the salon. I would just, it's too much. Do you, does it wear you out? I mean, we're all obviously a little older. Um some people can't even get into social media at our age. They're like, oh, oh. But you seem to be doing fine. Is it easy to handle or do you get stressed out? No, it's easy because the no material is there. You know, when, when you throw a, a lesson on the web, all you do have to do is just dump it into some other places, YouTube, Facebook, uh, Instagram. So it's click, dump, dump, and it's there. Right. For people to see. So. I don't spend too much time. I, I, I mean, to me, it's new. I just started with Instagram like six months ago, and um, I may, I way over the hump. I spend very little time with it now. I find out, you know, when, when people ship stuff, we ask them, how did you hear about us? So I would say 80% of them says the web, 10% say YouTube, and some percent say Facebook. Nobody's yet said Instagram. So I know that there is no return. I met you on Instagram. Well, but he didn't break any cash yet. Do you know? <laughs> Morty. <laughs> Morty. <laughs> Maybe it will. Maybe I don't know. But listen, this is how it starts. Yeah. I mean, I'm... Yeah. So, so, so the point is, I'm not focusing everybody on the cash. Fo everybody follow Morty on Instagram. Let's get his... <laughs> make him, <laughs> his attendance back up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, but again, make him feel the pressure. <laughs> I didn't mean to make, to make it sound like a pig, you know, just one money. Uh, no, it's not. It's... Uh, <laughs> The return that I see now is really one way I'm um, providing information. I'm not 
receiving and I don't check it out too often. If I have something to say, here it is. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so it's really coming from the giving point of view. Well, you're talking to two guys who are putting a lot out and getting nothing back. <laughs> you know what I mean? We get no money, <laughs> but you know, you have to have a love for it, right? Yeah, you do. Whether you it's do. pottery or podcasting, um, having a conversation. I love uh, people coming up to me all the time. I love that podcast. I love, you know, a person like you who may come down for the week, for this for the summer or part of the summer and have to go back to wherever Connecticut or Pennsylvania. Um, I've had several people say I love listening to the podcast because it keeps me kind of in touch with Rehoboth and just kind of what's going on. And um, you know, it's not money, but it's kind of cool. Well, speaking of that, I mean, do do you find now that you uh, get to choose your projects? More on like what you want to work on. Do, I mean, do you turn down stuff a lot more? I mean, obviously yeah. you don't have the the staff anymore, but we we do. The um, do you choose stuff like if if there's something that's maybe you can uh you know uh demand more for, but you don't want to work on as much. Do you, do you ever pass it up now? Yes, and, yeah. and and I don't know how to do it well yet. So mm-hmm. so I'm, I'm doing different things. That's actually a very good question. They the people like us, like if I die off, I don't know who's going to do it. There is so much to learn. Our internship was so long and nobody knew to do the full discipline. That, that's specialty in painting, specialty in sculpting. So so, so there is a lot of demand for that. Mm-hmm. And when we had staff, we could have caught up with that demand. Now we don't in the same demand or more. And um, because we have a lot of presence on the web, so we get and we have semi-automated system, we look sophisticated, you know, mm-hmm. we have all this award stuff, so it attracts people to us. And um, I start in um interviewing other restorers mm-hmm. and, and i pass it on to them once in a while i shut off the web uh, and i say i'm sorry we are not able to take new projects try again in july or june or whatever yeah. that is and and sometimes i don't know there's a project that it's a little bit risky so i charge more thinking the person going to pass and all of a sudden, you know, the bug shows up. Uh, yeah, so oh, now I got to so, do it. And, and I feel so uncomfortable charging more because then you have to remember things, you know, mm-hmm. uh, how can you charge more for one person or less? So, so, so I don't like that approach. So I find out that passing on work to others, but it's risky because your name is on the line. Do you really know they're good? So Right, right. If you don't want to do it, you have to pass it on. But if right. they're not good as, But know. that seemed to be the method that yeah. seemed to work the best. Yeah. Well, that's a, that is a good question. That is a, I think, um, you know, there's probably are things that come up and you're like, ah, I don't know if I want to even get into it, right? And and, and you don't know what's going to show up. You know, you do all this estimate. You assume you mm-hmm. get two boxes a day, which is, I don't know, 20% or 25% of the estimates you put through. But sometimes you get all of them. You open the door and, you know, higher than your height, it's just there, all these boxes. And, uh and forget, so I tell Patty, you know, the next few weeks, it's seven days a week, you know, because you don't have a lot of room, inventory or project in the queue. You promise all of them 12 to 14 weeks, assuming you're going to get a certain rate. If the rate is higher, now you're going to start being late. Um, so it's, that is the stressful part of the business of all mm-hmm. these humps that comes up. So if somebody has something that's busted and they need to get it fixed and they're thinking about it, maybe they've been like, gosh, now I've heard this podcast. Now I actually have maybe an idea of who can maybe fix my stuff. Do they just reach out, go to the to the Lakeside Pottery website, and contact you through there? And yeah, have a conversation because you are conversing with folks now. A little bit more. A little more, not too much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, you know the, the conversation not going to give them the cost and the time frame because we need to see certain. We ask certain questions, so I send them into the get estimate link, which it's. Uh, 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 interactive process. Okay. The subsequent questions are redesigned or reconfigure themselves based on the previous questions. Like, for example, if you ask them what's the material and they said plaster, we ask questions relevant to plaster. And, and they have to insert photos. So by having a conversation, it's going to be longer than the process and it's going to be incomplete. And after all these conversations, so, well, how much is going to cost? I said, I really don't know. You still have to do that. Well, I didn't mean like just to chit chat with you. I meant like oh, to with, find with, out with the, the direction they need to go to get yeah. it to the estimate thing. I mean, but they're going to call you and, and 
give you a, a, a chat for a second. At least you can say, hey, check out, go to the restoration part of our website and fill that out. And that'll be the first step. Right. And, and, and some of the charts, are, you know, you, you get a front seat to history. Like, like we did a project for Congress. Uh, Senator, uh, Congressman um, McGovern, his Abraham Lincoln statue broke. It was devastated. Hmm. And he had been through the riots. And uh, it did this, this past riot? Yeah. So you were called to f maybe fix something from this past riot? Yeah. All right. Now, this is juicy. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, very interesting. I, I mean, it wasn't a complicated repair, but, but it, um, it was important to me and eventually it turned to be to him to get it back before the inauguration. And I, we stopped everything we're doing. It was, a, was it a bust of, of, of Lincoln? Yeah. You know what's funny, Morty, is that I saw, I was watching something, and they, were try, they tried to say that Trump took that. They showed that, that Lincoln statue coming out of the White House. I don't know if it's the same one, but whatever. I mean, I, yeah, I, I guess I don't know if it was the same one. But I, it's funny because they showed this bust of Lincoln being taken out. And they're like, oh, like Trump took it, you know, or something like implying some ill will. Maybe that was the bust. Maybe there was a problem. And they were finding out if who's going to fix it. I don't know. But, but what, what I know is the personal connection. Uh, we, we, we exchanged emails, letters. I didn't spoke to him in person. But when I shipped the bust... And obviously, you're going to know my affiliation. I don't know. I don't know if I want to get into politics too much. But I wrote a personal letter through my own experiences. I'm originally from Israel. My parents are Holocaust survivors and da-da-da. So I wrote something, showed a picture of my father wearing the yellow star. Like, this picture was taken a week before he was taken to camp. He's still alive. He's 95 years old. And, and, and I'm saying, you know, I was afraid that something like this can happen here, maybe, if we're not paying attention to, to the trend of politics. You know, uh, I'm not Republican or Democrat. You know, I, I can vote for either one. So it's not politician affiliation with me. It's, it's like the character and where hate can take us. Mm. So, so I felt obligated to him the story. And he wrote back to me a per personal note, including inviting me for a personal tour in the White House in Congress. Wow. That, that, that the note meant a lot to him. Wow. And of course, we shipped it at no charge. But, but, but we encounter that's a story that. I would spend any time more need to have a conversation about it, or, or another story that, gosh, it's. So did you fix it? Or yeah, do you, oh yeah, yeah, it's, it's all fixed done. and done. Yeah, oh, it's done, yes. and it was available before the inauguration. Wow. Okay. So awesome. uh, you know, like it was this guy. He's eighty years old. He want to fix this thing that doesn't worth much, and he said, "Well, it's worth a lot to me." And he started telling me the story, and I'm saying, "Okay, I need to sit on the couch." So, so he's a doctor originally from France. He's like in his high eighties, but totally coherent and. Very, um, he expressed himself very effectively with this French accent. He lives in Washington, D.C. And he said, you want to hear why this is important to me? I said, okay, yeah. A and he proceeded with telling me that he was fighting with the partisans, with this Spanish guy. And the Spanish guy got injured in his hip. He got a bullet in his hip. And his village was across a forest between France and Spain. And he carried him for days to his village. His family could not thank him enough for saving their son alive. They were in the kitchen. They said, listen, we can't thank you with anything. We are poor. And there was this vase right in the middle of the table. And they gave it to him. And that's what broke. So, so, so to me, I mean, uh, the story took on for two hours listening. And it was fascinating. Basically, you're just listening to history with a person that is still alive, telling you the details of what being a partisan was. And why he carried this for the rest of his life. That's crazy that someone would take like a vase as a payment. Yeah. You know, back in the, you know, back in the day. Right. You know, now we, we use Bitcoin or uh, <laughs> Venmo. <laughs> I'll take a Venmo. <laughs> well, listen, Marty, I, thank you for coming on. Uh, you know, I, I feel like if we, you and I could probably chat all day. You probably have a lot of great stories. And um, I appreciate that. I just, you know, the point of the podcast is just one small business helping another. You know, we're not saving the world. We're just trying to get a little light on each other and, and, and show, you know, whether it's coming down from Connecticut, you know, getting a little bit of the taste of the town and, and making the big move and, and, and having faith that it's all going to work out or, you know, working for somebody and just leaping out and starting on your own. It's just the premises is that if you put enough work and you put your mind to something, you could probably succeed. 
if, if, if you work hard. And um, that's what it's about. So I appreciate you coming on. If somebody wants to, I mean, if you want to see the stuff that, I mean, you have a great website, a lot of pictures, a lot of stuff that you've been working on or worked on. Um, a lot of uh, personal personal notes, too, from customers, I, I assume. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. A lot of them. And that is Lakeside Pottery, right? Yep. Lakesidepottery.com. Yeah, thank www. you. www.lakesidepottery.com. What's your Instagram? Uh, Lakeside Pottery. Uh, no underscores or anything, just Lakeside Pottery. Yes. Lakeside Pottery on Instagram. And uh, check them out. And if you have something that you need repaired, give Morty a call. <laughs> <laughs> He'll chat you up. <laughs> Thank you, buddy. How, uh, have a great day. I Thank appreciate you. it. I appreciate your time. All right. Bye -bye. We'll talk to you soon. Today's sponsor, W Films. W Films is a full-service video production company located in Lewis, Delaware. Need help getting your message out on social media? How about creating a brand film for your company's website? W Films experts can help you create the perfect video and help you get the social media attention you've been looking for. W Films also specializes in marketing materials for real estate. They can provide cinematic video tour, HDR photography, and a fully immersive 360-degree tour to help your property get sold faster and for more money. To find out more, go to wfilmsmedia.com or call 302-569-0725. 302-569-0725. Everyone has a story. Let us tell yours.